And now, Peter Paul Mounds, Almond Joy, and Cadbury Chocolate Bars presents Alien Worlds. Slowly rotating at the edge of deep space, 1,000 kilometers beyond the atmosphere of 21st century Earth, is the Arthur C. Clarke Astronomical Observatory, Star Lab. Here, Star Lab Research Director, Dr. Maura Cassidy, and scientists and technicians of the International Space Authority, ISA, watch over the countless stars and planets that fill the silent distances beyond the giant space station. This week, the men and women of Star Lab become entangled in the adventure of the Egyptian necklace, an intergalactic detective story in the Sherlock Holmes tradition on Alien Worlds. British Museum freighter Nile Delta, commanded by Captain Jack Lemus, is returning to Earth from the planet Thanatos. Aboard the freighter, the priceless King Tut exhibit, sent to Thanatos two weeks earlier as part of an interplanetary cultural exchange program. Nile Delta to Starlab Control. This is Starlab. Go ahead, Nile Delta. Is that you, Jerry? Affirmative, Captain. Are you planning to dock at Star Lab on your way home? No, not this time. An ISA tanker came up from Cannabis 12 and refueled us on the other side of Saturn. No, I just wanted to say hello and invite you around for a visit if uh, you're ever in London. My wife's got quite a lovely sister she's trying to marry off. And I've got some 40-year-old brandy that'll lift you right out of your boots. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation, Captain. I'll take you up on it the first chance I get. I'll be looking for you. Nile Delta, clear. Star Lab, out. That alien ship's back again, Captain. 3,500 meters off the port bow. Have you tried to contact her? Uh, we tried, but she still doesn't respond. All right, let's have another look at her. Full magnification this time. Hey, she's a beauty, isn't she? All white and slim like that. Do you recognize any of the markings, Tony? Um, uh, wait a minute. What's that on the tail fin? The sun symbol. No, no, just below it. The blue and gold bird with its wings spread out. Isn't that the same? Hold on. She's dropping down a bit. Tony, she's been damaged. Top of the hull, amidships. There go the SOS flares. Let's get up alongside of her and see if we can help. As the Nile Delta's navigator maneuvers the red and gray freighter into a side-by-side -side position with the damaged alien ship, Captain Lemus and first mate Tony Cargill put on bright blue pressure suits and enter the freighter's airlock. A moment later, an enclosed metal flex walkway slowly telescopes from the Nile Delta's airlock to an access hatch which has irised open in the hull of the fluorescent white alien spacecraft. You're very generous to give us your time and kindness. Well, hello. Who are you? My name is Piratep. I'm glad you didn't abandon us. Yours is the only vessel we've seen since the accident. When did it happen? Three days ago. And some of our mariners have been injured. Is there a healer aboard your vessel? Y yes, there is. And we have a complete medical facility as well. Then if you'll please follow me, we can begin transferring our injured to your ship. If you wish to remove your helmets, you'll be in no danger. We're oxygen breathers, too. Ooh, well, that's better, isn't it? Hi, it was getting a bit stuffy in there. This is Amontef. Which of you is Captain Lemus? Well, I am. A... How do you know my name? We know the names of everyone aboard the Nile Delta. 
we also know it carries the afterlife treasures and mummified body of Tutankhamun. Your ship isn't damaged at all, is it? No, it isn't. Don't look now, Captain, but I think we've been set up for a little of the old smash and grab. What the bloody hell do you want with the King Tut treasure? It only has value on Earth. It's worthless out here. We don't want the entire treasure, Captain. Only the beaded floral necklace. It's not mine to give you. And even if it were, I wouldn't. I have a rule against being overly charitable to anyone who makes a fool of me or my friends. Come on, Tony, let's get back to the ship. Please, Captain, don't force me to use this weapon. A weapon? A tiny little thing? Let's get out of here, Captain. I'm on tap. Stop them, Pirate. Oh. Oh. Tony! Tony! Continue. Get the sensation, the cool combination, chocolatey and mint. Drop peppermint patty. Cool sensation, a perfect relation, chocolatey and mint. From Peter Paul. Cool as the snow falling light on the trees. Just take a bite for a cool minty freeze. Get your peppermint patty. And get the sensation. is returning to Earth from the planet Thanatos. Aboard the freighter, the treasure of the Egyptian boy king, Tutankhamun. Midway between Earth and Saturn, a damaged alien spacecraft appears and fires SOS flares. Nile Delta Captain Jack Lemus and first mate Tony Cargill board the alien ship to offer assistance. But inside, they discover they have fallen into a trap set by the aliens who want a beaded floral necklace from the King Tut treasure. An hour later on Star Lab, Dr. Maura Cassidy and SET Captain John Graydon, not yet aware of the Nile Delta incident, enter the vestibule of Star Lab's visual media theater. How long has Buddy been in there? About six hours. Six hours? Was he watching the outtakes from Gravity's Rainbow? Oh, no, that was yesterday. Uh, Sunday, he sat through five old Stanley Kubrick films, and Monday, it was a Daffy Duck Festival. Uh, what he's watching today is anybody's guess. Maybe he fell asleep. Well, I wish he'd sleep a little faster. We're going to be late. Hi, Maura. Hi, John. Hi, Buddy. Buddy, didn't your mother ever tell you that if you watched too many movies, your face would break out and you'd go blind? Very funny. Uh, I think you've got that mixed up with something else, Maura. I do? What? Uh, I'll tell you later. Uh, well, buddy, uh, what'd you see today? The Guiding Light, All My Children, and Search for Tomorrow. They're television soap operas from the 60s and 70s. Soap operas? Why do they call them that? Were they musicals about people getting clean? <laughs> Not exactly, Maura. They were mostly about people getting dirty. <laughs> Dr. Cassidy, please contact the control bridge. Oh, we'll never make the lecture at this rate. Have they repaired the intercom terminal in the theater, buddy? Well, it was working this morning. Hmm. Be back in a minute. What did you think of those music tapes Ingrid brought back from Calibria? I was listening to one when I turned in last night. Uh, you know, the one with all the voices? The hymn to the vanished canal? Yeah, yeah, that's it. And I fell asleep while it was still running and I dreamed about kaleidoscope faces and stained glass animals all night. 
incredible. Let's get up to the bridge. Something's happened to the Nile Delta. When we woke up, we were back aboard the Nile Delta. The rest of my chaps were still knocked out, and the necklace and the aliens were gone. Is the necklace the only thing missing? Uh, we don't know yet. We're still checking the manifest. Have you notified the museum yet? I'm going to do that just as soon as... Stand by, Starlab. Dr. Cassidy, our medical officer, Dr. Lomax, he's just come up from the cargo bay. He said the aliens opened the coffin, unwrapped the mummy down to the neck, and took a tissue sample from its face. A tissue sample? Is Dr. Lomax absolutely certain about that? He's positive, Dr. Cassidy, and he's holding up a little gold surgical instrument they dropped. We'll put it in a safe place and we'll analyze it when you get here. See you around midnight, Captain. Starlab out. Nile Delta, clear. Buddy, John, what do you think? Well, we've got about nine hours before the Nile Delta gets here. Let's go down to the library and pull the King Tut tapes out of the Egyptology section. Maybe we can turn up something. Why not? Meanwhile, at the Royal British Museum in London, Sir Dorian Bradford Gray, the museum's director, receives word of the Nile Delta incident. Fifteen minutes later, Sir Dorian reports the incident to British Prime Minister Lord Henry Gladstone Baggs. Within the hour, Lord Henry enters Buckingham Palace and conveys the news to Her Majesty, Queen Victoria III. And what about the aliens who perpetrated this awful crime, Lord Henry? Does the Ministry have any idea who they are? Um, I I'm afraid we're still in the dark about that, Your Majesty. Hmm. Hand us the royal pen and ink, Lord Henry, and some royal stationery, too. This incident requires the services of England's most famous consulting detective. Agreed? Oh, yes, by all means, Your Majesty, by all means. Now, let's see. From Victoria Regina the Third. Yes, yes, Your Majesty. Sonar T. Oh, without any shadow of a doubt, My dear Mr. Foom, a matter of some urgency has arisen, yes. which you, requires your immediate and undivided attention. Oh, Britannia. Meanwhile, in the heart of London's West End, Sonar T. Foom and his associate, Dr. McGuffin Drone, are spending a quiet afternoon in their rooms at 221B Pennybaker Street. Did you say something, Drone? I really must protest, Foom. That instrument of yours had my London Gazette vibrating so rapidly, I could scarcely read today's news. Oh, please forgive me, Drone. But you know how restless I am when there's nothing afoot to test my keen powers of observation and deduction. And music does, after all, soothe the savage beast. Well, if it's savage beasts you're interested in soothing, perhaps you should consider taking up residence at the zoo. Careful, Drone. I think you're skating on rather thin ice with that one. Just a moment. Do my ears deceive me, or is that Mrs. Hudson's cat-like tread upon the stair? Yes, that's Mrs. Hudson, all right. No question about it. Come in, Mrs. Hudson. Why, Mr. Foom, how on earth did you know it was me? Elementary, my dear Mrs. Hudson. There are just the three of us in the entire house. 
The doors and windows are latched from the inside. Dr. Drone and myself are, as you can plainly see, here in this room, which left only you, Mrs. Hudson, unaccounted for. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Foam, you never cease to amaze me. I also perceive an envelope between the thumb and forefinger of your right hand, Mrs. Hudson. White, six inches square, addressed to me in violet ink. Oh, my, yes, I nearly forgot. It just arrived. May I have the envelope, please? Thank you. Hmm... A message from none other than Her Royal Majesty. You don't say. Her Royal Majesty. How did you know that, Foom? The return address, my dear drone. I recognize the royal zip code. Your powers of observation are absolutely uncanny, Foom. Yes. And now... Egad, drone. The Nile Delta's been set upon by alien beings, and King Tutankhamun's floral necklace has been purloined. Her Majesty requests that we go to Star Lab at once and assist in the investigation of this beastly crime. Mrs. Hudson, call the airfield and tell Smattering to prepare the Bellerophon. Right away, Mr. Foam. Now, let's get our equipment sorted out, Drone. The game is afoot, and a new adventure is at hand. Alien Worlds will continue. Ooh, baby, I'm confessing, this man's got a fickle way. Now, maybe you won't like it much, but to explain, I gotta say. Continues. The Royal British Museum freighter Nile Delta is returning to Earth from Thanatos. Aboard the freighter, the treasures of Tutankhamun sent to Thanatos two weeks earlier for exhibition. Midway between Earth and Saturn, the freighter is boarded by aliens who steal the King Tut floral necklace and take a tissue sample from the face of the boy king's mummy. When news of the Nile Delta incident reaches Queen Victoria III, she quickly notifies consulting detective Sonar T. Foom. Let's get our equipment sorted out, Drone. Her Majesty respectfully requests that we go to Star Lab at once and assist in the investigation of this beastly crime. At the Pennybaker Street tube station, Foom and Drone board an urban link train that carries them to a small spaceport near Croydon. Crossing the field to launch pad six, they board Foom's powerful multi-atmosphere cruiser, the Bellerophon, England's most sophisticated privately owned spacecraft. 30 seconds later, the Bellerophon jets out over the gray waters of the English Channel, banks up into a glacier-like mass of white clouds, and rockets away towards Starland. Erica finishes replacing the AE-35 module, huh? Will do, Dr. Cassidy. See you later. Let's see. Nine o'clock. Well, time to feed my fish.
Hi, Winston. Hi, Emmett. Hi, Orpheus. Dr. Cassidy. Hi, Dorothy. Yes, Dorothy, what is it? I have a transmission coming through from ISA headquarters. It's Commissioner White. I'll take it here, patch him through. Mara, I just received a transmission from the British Prime Minister. Sonar T. Foom is on his way up to help with the Nile Delta investigation. Good. I've always wanted to meet that man. When did he leave? All about an hour ago. He should be docking in a few minutes. He and his partner officially represent the British government in this case, Mara, so give him all the help you can. All right, Commissioner, I'll keep you posted. Star Lab out. <laughs> This is Star Lab. Go ahead, Bellerophon. What is Star Lab's rotational profile? Mm, 18 per minute on a variable axis of 0 0.3 degrees. Non-correctable. Thank you so much. At our present rate of speed and your present rate of rotation, I calculate our docking orbit insertion coordinates will be... 208 degrees at subvector 671. Mm, uh, hold on a minute. That's right. Did you calculate that in your head? Of course. That's amazing. Uh, nothing to it, really. Now, what do you have in the way of empty docking bays? Uh, number 14. Thank you so much. And will you please inform Dr. Cassidy that we'll be there in one minute, 13 seconds. <laughs> will do. Star Lab, out. All right, Jerry, have Polly bring them to my quarters as soon as they dock, huh? Okay, Mara. Well, you two look more red-eyed than usual. Where have you been? We went back to the library after dinner and ran the King Tut tapes again. Did you come up with anything? Yeah. You know that blue and gold bird symbol Captain Lemus described? Uh, the one on the tail fin of the alien ship? Mm hmm We found one just like it on King Tut's ecclesiastical chair. Oh, what does the bird represent? Well, it's actually a sacred vulture, and it represents the goddess Nekebet, a guardian of Upper Egypt and protectors of childbirth. When Captain Lemus gets here, we should run his visual scanner tapes of the alien ship against the library tapes to see if the symbols match. And if they do? If they do, we've concocted a pretty bizarre theory to explain why. I'm listening. Well, if the symbols match, and this is strictly hypothetical now, if they match, then maybe the aliens aren't aliens after all. Maybe they're Egyptians. Oh, come on, you two. Modern Egypt isn't capable of the kind of technology Captain Lee must describe. That's the bizarre part of the theory, Laura. We're not talking about modern Egypt. We're talking about ancient Egypt. Good evening, Dr. Cassidy. Mr. Foam. Dr. Drone, welcome to Starlight. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Cassidy. Uh, Mara, please. Uh, and uh, who are these gentlemen, Mara? Space Exploration Team Captains John Grayton and Buddy Griff. Oh, oh how you know, do you know, Nice to meet you. I believe you were discussing the possibility that the aliens who boarded the Nile Delta might in fact be ancient Egyptians. Something like that, Doctor. It's a theory Buddy and John dreamed up. Hmm. I think we're going to get on very well indeed, gentlemen. Dr. Drone and myself were discussing a similar hypothesis not more than 15 minutes ago. You were? Congratulations, Captain Green. Uh, thank you, Captain Griff. Uh, Mr. Foom, with all due respect to you and Dr. Drone, I find it hard to believe that we're dealing with 3,300-year-old Egyptians. Not 3,300-year-old Egyptians, Mora but rather the descendants of the high priests and priestesses who departed the earth following Tutankhamun's death. Departed the earth? How? The King Tut library tapes were full of references to skyships, Mora. Tell me, gentlemen, did your theory arise from Captain Lima's description of the Nekhebit symbol on the tail fin of the alien ship? That and the way the aliens were dressed. Yes. Captain Lemus conveyed those very same descriptions to the museum. Fascinating, isn't it? All right. Suppose these aliens are what you think they are. That still doesn't explain the theft of the necklace or why they took a tissue sample from the mummy. The necklace is a puzzlement, Mora. 
but the tissue specimen isn't. It has long been our contention that the Egyptian kings were preserved for only one reason, so that in future their tissue could be rejuvenated for the purpose of monocellular replication. Cloning. You mean you actually believe these aliens intend to duplicate Tutankhamun? The ancient Egyptian religion was completely devoted to the concept of life after death, Mora. Most scholars and historians still maintain that the Egyptian afterlife was simply an abstract journey through an equally abstract underworld. Dr. Drone and myself think otherwise. We believe the Egyptian underworld was a metaphor to describe the very real fact of physical immortality. Thou art standing before Ra, who cometh from the east. His duration of life is infinite. His limit of life is everlastingness. Become one with Ra, and be received into the land of eternal triumph. A verse from the Papyrus of Ani, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, telling of a journey into the regions of life everlasting, immortality, the most beautiful and mysterious of all alien worlds. One of the adventure of the Egyptian necklace was written by Ron Thompson and starred Linda Gary, Chuck Olson, Bruce Philip Miller, and Corey Burton, with special guest stars Philip Clark, John Abbott, Joe Baker, John Galt, Carol Bilger, and Nora Denny. Associate producer Ron Thompson, music director Tom Rounds, engineer Stu Jacobs, assistants to the producer. Roger Brossi and Jim Cook, technical consultant Peter Sky. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen, and is distributed by Watermark Incorporated. And so, until next week, this is Roger Dressler inviting you to join us for the conclusion of the adventure of the Egyptian necklace from the elsewhere and elsewhen of Alien Worlds. Peter Paul and Cadbury chocolate bars. Hope you have enjoyed Alien Worlds.